Hello, Underwater Acoustics Conference 2021. My name is Ole Lorentzen and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Oslo and the scientist at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment, or FFI, in Norway. Today I'm presenting this work on 3D rendering of shipwrecks using synthetic aperture sonar, or SAS, together with my colleagues Roy Hansen, Torstein Sabe, Stig Sunes, and Mark Geiger. First, I'll introduce SAS and describe what products we have available from state-of-the-art SAS processing. Then I will describe and illustrate common visualization techniques and discuss improvements and advances. I'll briefly discuss coloring before moving on to our proposed three-dimensional visualization methods. I will discuss and show examples of some 3D rendering techniques. And finally, I will show some example results using our techniques. Synthetic aperture sonar technology has matured in recent years and is currently in use by industry, academia and military users globally. Common products in use are SAS waterfall or images, which can be exported as geographically referenced data to GIS software. Some users also use the bathymetry data from SAS, though the adoption of high-resolution SAS bathymetry is still uncommon. Side scan bathymetry has been more common in the past. One of the most effective ways of using a SAS system is mounted to an autonomous underwater vehicle. This is because of the necessity of bringing the sensor relatively close to the seafloor and the requirements on platform stability in order to produce sharp SAS images. We use the Hugin AUV with the HiSAS 1032, both developed by FFI and Kongsberg Maritime. The HiSAS is an interferometric SAS with two horizontal receiver arrays and a vertical transmit array. This system transmits a wide beam and sonifying a large area of the seafloor. The horizontal receive array is used for beamforming along the travel direction and time delay estimation is used for range estimation across the travel direction. With the phased array system and time delay estimation, we can produce beams in different directions. We can create sector scan images for each ping, producing a cake slice representation. Taking the broadside or center beam of the sector scan for each ping position and stacking it as an image, we get the side scan solar image. Synthetic aperture uses the beamforming as in the sector scan method in order to coherently combine pings. If we focus the beam on a specific position on the seafloor and integrate accurately over many pings, we get a theoretical along track resolution of only half the size of an array element. This is range and frequency independent. And while the resolution is range independent, the signal to noise ratio is not. Therefore, the image quality starts to degrade as the range increases. Adding measurements from more and more pings slowly sharpens the SAS image into the full synthetic aperture resolution. Products of state-of-the-art SAS processing usually include the side scan images, side scan bathymetry depth estimates, side scan bathymetry coherence or quality estimates, and obviously the SAS images. Then interferometry can provide SAS bathymetric depth estimates, including the interferogram itself, the depth estimate, geometrically corrected SAS images, the SAS bathymetry coherence quality estimate, and the gradient or slope on the seafloor. Visualizing these products is most commonly done by 2D images, as we have shown here. An alternative visualization similar to the 2D images is 2D scatter plots, which gives the ability to display the actual data points without the interpolation needed to fit an image grid. Furthermore, as more advanced visualization, we can do three dimensional scatter plots showing even more of the data. The problem with two dimensional visualization is that even though the system is not fully volumetric, we can still have data that is in the same horizontal position in a ground reference coordinate system. So, in order to grid the data in such coordinates, we have to remove some of it. 3D scatter plots are able to dis display all the data points, but it's still not trivial to communicate the information in a way that's easily comprehensible. Other advanced methods for visualization are surfaces. The most common is what is often referred to as 2.5D surfaces. The concept is that we use the XY positions from the three dimensional depth estimates in order to perform triangulation and create a planar surface. Then we add the depth information by offsetting the vertices vertically. 
This is more convenient to solve mathematically, but does not eliminate the issue of not being able to represent all of the available data. For a nice, smooth C floor, this can work well, but for a complicated bathymetry, this does not always give the desired result. Methods exist for three-dimensional triangulation also, but the mathematical frameworks for these are often complicated and computationally heavy, and they still don't always produce the desired result. Finally, we have the option of visualizing each, each vertex individually, as in a three-dimensional scatter plot, either by emitting light from each vertex or by inserting an object in each vertex position. Given the amount of data, this solution can obviously be very compute heavy. Coloring the data is where the science becomes an art. We have already shown coloring by depth and backscatter values, which are very common in scientific visualization. But we have a lot of different data products that contain complementary information. And if we can incorporate more of that in a way that improves the perception, we should. Here's an example of a method we call fusion coloring, where we mix the backscatter depth and coherence or quality with a custom color map in order to produce new colors. We will focus on point cloud rendering from here on out. First, we consider vertex emission. This is a shader technique that makes the faces emit omnidirectional light with a given color and intensity. This resembles the way that, for example, MATLAB renders a 3D point cloud with a scatter-free function. The advantages of this method are that it's quite easy to set up, and it ensures that all the data points will be visible from all directions. The drawbacks are that we don't get the advantage of using artificial light sources to produce a more natural-looking render, and we also have less interactive change of the visualization when we are changing the view. These scatter plots were made with MATLAB, but from here on out, we will use the open source 3D rendering software Blender. Vertex instancing involves inserting a shape in the position of each vertex. The shape can be a 2D shape, like a triangle or a plane, or it can be a 3D shape, like a trihedra, a cube, or a sphere. Inserting a sphere is intuitively a good option, as it will be less prone to issues when varying the look angle. However, a lot of vertices and faces are required to represent the sphere. Therefore, when instancing one in each vertex, we can end up with a number of vertices and faces that's difficult to handle. For example, a 150 by 200 meter large SAS image with initially 2 cm resolution will be 7,500 by 10,000 samples, or 75 million vertices. A default smooth sphere in Blender contains 482 vertices or 512 faces, but if we're being practical, we can reduce this to, for example, 22 vertices and 25 faces, and then we can use smooth shading in the shader in, or in order to, uh, to uh, make this look more smooth. And even though it's not quite smooth, we can settle for this. This would still yield uh, 75 million by 22 vertices, or a total of about one and a half billion vertices. And more importantly, it would yield 25 faces per vertex. And now we're talking about two billion faces. This would mean inserting 22 vertices and 25 faces per original vertex. So we're talking almost two billion faces. Rendering, rendering this is indeed very compute heavy. If we instead choose a simpler shape, for example a triangle, we reduce this to only three vertices per initial vertex and only a single face per vertex. This means that instead of rendering two billion faces, we are only rendering 75 million of them. And that's still quite compute heavy, so the reduction of the computational burden here is an important consideration. Object instancing can be done quite easily in Blender, but doing so is also unstable and slow in our experience. Therefore, we suggest a method to do this manually ourselves in MATLAB, and then export uh, the instance objects instead of the original dataset. In addition, we suggest to add colors to the vertices and rotate the shape by the estimated slope direction, that is, rotate the object to be orthogonal to the estimated normal vector. This gives the scene some needed texture and also incorporates yet another data product. 
When we have a scene of surface objects representing our SAS data set, we go ahead by adding a synthetic lighting. We can add background lighting, such as a sun, which has parallel light rays, omnidirectional sources, or spotlight sources with direction and angular limitations. Furthermore, we can add volumetrics in order to give the perception of an underwater scene. We are no experts in this field, uh, and this could obviously be improved by an expert 3D artist, but this is the concept of such visualization. The final step is adding a camera to observe the scene through and animating its movement. We can program the camera to simulate real camera characteristics, such as depth of field or focus, and various other optical camera parameters, such as the focal length. This makes a big difference for human perception, since this imitates the way that we are used to seeing the world, and especially through photographic and videographic images. We can have dynamic camera movements to showcase different aspects of the datasets, and we can create more or less successful dramatic effects of an otherwise dull and quiet seafloor. Then we can, of course, also add whatever effects in 3D rendering that we would like. Some spheric particles emitting from a slightly curved surface to imitate bubbles is just one example of what could be done. Finally, we can put it all together and create renders that hopefully show our data in even more detail than before. We can showcase the details in the dataset close up and perform dramatic reveals of the scene. Using camera movement, motion blur, and depth of field, we can create life and photorealism in the render. And with that, I would like to end by showing you two more complete examples of uh, such rendering that we've made. The first one is rec number five from the Skagerrak Chemical Munitions Dump Site in the Skagerrak Sea, south of Norway, between Norway and Denmark. And here we start with a close-up of some debris that is connected to the wreck, and then we slowly move up, revealing more of the sea. We can see that we added some bubbles to create some life in the scene and we can see some details on the wreckage here and we see that it's it's broken in two because here we, here we uh, reveal the second part we move through the bubbles in order to create some more life and then we pivot around and reveal all of the scattered debris that is sort of flowing out of the wreck here where it's broken in two all of these uh, small objects on the seafloor are um, uh, chemical mun munitions that have scattered from the wreckage. Then we twist and move out and fly up to reveal a more overview of the scene. And we can notice here that we have spotlights lighting up the, uh, the wreckage and then the rest of the scene is quite dark. We also have spotlights. Um, emphasizing the, the scattered debris. Then we'll show you wreck number 18 from the same dump site. Uh, and here we start with a real close-up where we can actually see the separate triangles. Then we uh, pitch up and we show the bow of the ship and we move up slowly in order to reveal the length of the ship. Then we try a more dramatic camera movement uh, going up and over the ship showing it in a more uh, traditional way, directly looking down on it. And then we go from the stern and we fly along the side of the hull in order to, and quite close to the seafloor, to get the effect of, of the movement. And here we can also notice that we have added some, uh, some uh, very strong specular re reflections in order to uh, give these glimpses. Then we focus on some wreckage, uh, some debris here, like a ladder or something like that before we move up and give another overview of, from the bow of the ship you can see the deck and the, and the loading base and then we rotate out and fly away in order to give an overview of the wreck again we see that we uh, chose to highlight the ship with the uh, spotlights we also added uh, an extra spotlight on the side here that was mostly for the fly-in part, where we flew in along the seafloor down there. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and hope that you find this presentation interesting. 
Feel free to look up more details in the paper or contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.